Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's activity is experimental verification of series circuit properties. Our objective today is to verify series circuit properties using real-world components and common electrical instrumentation. We'll observe that current anywhere in a series path is the same and use Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and the voltage divider rule to predict observed quantities. We'll demonstrate the effects of opens and short circuits inside series circuits, Finally, we'll wrap up the exercise with a bonus round lab activity that includes voltage sources in series. This activity will tie together a number of topics, including basic series circuit properties, Kirchhoff's voltage law, the voltage divider rule, and switches in addition to all those prerequisites for the previous experimental verification of Ohm's law lecture. If you've been following this playlist in its intended sequence, or if you're already intimately familiar with these topics, no worries. If not, I definitely recommend hitting these prerequisite lectures available at the Big Bad Tech channel prior to continuing. This activity is especially exciting for me because it represents a synthesis of a number of topics, presents yet another opportunity to demonstrate that I am not some dim-witted peddler of nonsense. These properties are real, verifiable, and extremely useful tools. I'm encouraging you to get involved with this activity and pause the lecture often to perform the required calculations. If you get lost, I'll be right there to guide you to the correct solution. This exercise should be especially satisfying because using limited observations in electrical theory, you can predict reality. That's the point. Real series circuit properties with some margin of error really do work like I've been telling you they do. First, we're going to build a basic three resistor series circuit and measure the voltage across each component and the current through each component. Then we'll intentionally open and short out components to observe the effects this might have on other circuit properties. Finally, we'll bring it on home with a quick lab activity that employs not elements in series, but rather sources. Part one of this activity makes use of a series circuit of three resistors supplied by a single 12 volt source. R1 is 270 ohms, R2 is 330 ohms, R3 is 470 ohms. Pause the lecture and solve for the voltage across each component, the current through each component, and the power dissipated by each component. Additionally, solve for source current and the power supplied by the source. Here's the challenge though. You are only authorized to use Ohm's law twice, and you are not to directly calculate total resistance until the very last step. This challenge will ensure that you make use of the available tool set I've laid out for you, notably basic series circuit properties, the voltage divider rule, and Kirchhoff's voltage law. Accept the challenge and do not be lured into solving for total resistance up front. You'll be glad you did so now when presented with a challenging troubleshooting scenario with only partial information in the future. Here's how I'm going to solve for the desired quantities. You may have used different steps in a different sequence, but our answers should agree. We'll start by using the VDR to solve for V1, the voltage drop across resistor 1. The voltage divider rule states that the voltage across an element of interest is equal to the resistance of the element of interest divided by the resistance of that series path times the total applied voltage of that series path. In this case, our element of interest is R1. The total resistance of this series path is R1 plus R2 plus R3, and our total applied voltage is our generic supply voltage, E. Substituting in the necessary values, we find V1 to be approximately equal to 3.03 volts. We could use the VDR to again solve for the voltage drop across R2, but since we've got two Ohm's law bullets in our belt, let's fire them off and see what they hit. With a known voltage drop across a known resistor, we can easily calculate the current through R1, where I1 equals V1 divided by R1. We find I1 to be approximately 11.21 milliampers. Making use of the most fundamental of basic series circuit properties, we realize this same 11.21 milliampers of current must travel through every single element in our series path, because by its definition, a series arrangement is an inline relationship. IS equals I1 equals I2 equals I3, and they all equal 11.21 milliampers. With known current traveling through R2, we can use Ohm's law to calculate the voltage drop across it, where V2 equals I2 times R2. Substituting in the necessary values, we find V2 
to be approximately 3.70 volts. Since we've spent our remaining allotment of Ohm's law and benched the voltage divider rule for excessive awesomeness, we're left with Kirchhoff's voltage law. Performing a KVL analysis for this circuit starting here and traveling in this direction, we rise our generic supply voltage E, fall V1, fall V2, fall V3. Our KVL equation for this series circuit is E equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. Given E is a known value, and we solve for V1 and V2 using the VDR and Ohm's law respectively, we can substitute these values into our KVL equation and solve for V3, where V3 equals approximately 5.27 volts. Now we can calculate the power dissipated by each element. The power dissipated by R1 is the voltage across it times the current through it, approximately 33.96 milliwatts. The power dissipated by R2 is the voltage across it squared divided by its resistance, approximately 41.51 milliwatts. The power dissipated by R3 is the current through it squared times its resistance, approximately 59.11 milliwatts. Given our understanding that power in always equals power out, power supplied by the source is equal to the summation of the power dissipated by individual elements. P in equals P1 plus P2 plus P3. Substituting in the calculated values for P1, P2, and P3, we find power input to this system by the source to be approximately 134.58 milliwatts. We are done calculating expected results. We can now build this circuit and verify realities in accordance with our theory. Notice at no time did the solution to this problem necessitate the direct calculation of total resistance. To those rigidly reliant upon a complete and clearly marked trail, you will be sorely unfit for a career as a troubleshooter. Very rarely are you given the complete picture and you are often reliant upon creative interpretation of basic series circuit properties, reasoning ability, and good, organized, and efficient work practices. This being said, one can solve for total resistance using several equally valid interpretations, notably a restatement of Ohm's law from the perspective of the source, where RT equals our source voltage E divided by our source current IS, two permutations of the power equations, where RT equals the voltage squared divided by power input, or RT equals the power input divided by source current squared, or for unimaginative drones, the series resistance summation formula, where RT equals R1 plus R2 plus R3. Either of these four calculations yield a total resistance of 1,070 ohms. This is a great check. If you've done everything correct, either method should link up and give each other a high five and a hearty bear hug. If any one result misses the agreed upon rally point and drives right on by, you can be assured that one or more of your assumptions or calculations were made in error. Note other opportunities to check our work. Given all elements in a series network carry the same current, and Ohm's law states that the voltage drop across an element is the current times resistance, V equals IR, the largest resistor in this series relationship should have the largest voltage drop, and the smallest resistor in this series relationship should have the smallest voltage drop. This is in fact what we're observing. R3 is the largest resistor, and it has the largest voltage drop. R1 is the smallest resistor and has the smallest voltage drop. Additionally, Kirchhoff's voltage law states that the sum of voltage rises should equal the sum of voltage drops. What goes up must come down. E equals V1 plus V2 plus V3. Substituting in our calculated values yields an equivalent voltage drop accompanying our voltage rise. We can be reasonably certain our results are correct. Taking a brief scan of power figures, we see R1, the smallest resistor, is dissipating the least amount of power. R3, the largest resistor, is dissipating the most amount of power. And power input does equal power output as expected. Such a quick scan of expected results, even if you're sure they're correct, prevents the chance of a simple clerical error, for example transposing V1 with V2, and vice versa, from becoming a regretful second guessing of ordinarily correct results. Stay organized and do yourself the favor of making sure everything is in its place before you begin. I'm your electronics instructor, not your mama. Your mama should have taught you to put your stuff where it belongs. Last but not least, make sure the components you intend to use can handle the expected power dissipation. 
Our largest power figures are three, dissipating 59.11 milliwatts of power. 59 milliwatts. That's less power than a butterfly's sneeze. The cheapest of quarter watt, i.e. 250 milliwatt resistors, will do the trick quite nicely. Armed with expectations, we're ready to begin the lab. Pause the lecture and see if you can determine the four band color code for the three resistors we require, assuming plus or minus 5% tolerance. 270 ohm resistor is a two, red, seven, purple, followed by one, zero. The third band is brown, red, purple, brown, gold. A 330 ohm resistor is an orange three, followed by an orange three, followed by one brown zero. The four band color code for a 330 ohm resistor is orange, orange, brown, gold. The four band color code for a 470 ohm resistor is a yellow four, a purple seven, followed by one brown zero. Yellow, purple, brown, gold. Go fetch. Do yourself the favor of checking the resistance values of the components prior to assembling the circuit. No sense in using the wrong resistor as a result of a mistaken reading of the color code or a bum component that's just going to fall apart the moment an electron knocks on the front door. Our 270 ohm resistor is actually 0.2661 kilo ohms or 266.1 ohms, well inside the expected tolerance range. Our 330 ohm resistor is actually 327.5 ohms, well inside the expected tolerance range. Similarly, our 470 ohm resistor is actually 461 ohms, well inside the expected tolerance range. If we twist these three resistors together in a single line and take the resistance reading from end to end, we read 1.0541 kilo ohms, or 1054.1 ohms of total resistance. Notice our total resistance is ever so slightly less than our calculated value of 1070 ohms because the observed values for our individual resistors was slightly undershot each time. If our total resistance for this series combination is ever so slightly lower than we'd expect, I'd be willing to wager that the current through this series relationship will be ever so slightly higher than our calculated value of 11.21 milliampers. This being said, it's not a drastic departure from our expectations, and we're gonna proceed as intended. If you had inadvertently grabbed a 2.7 ohm, or 2.7 kilo ohm resistor instead of a 270 ohm resistor or hook the correct resistors in a totally incorrect fashion, we'd be observing a resistance value for this combination radically different than our expected total resistance of 1070 ohms. The point is, don't jump out of a perfectly good plane without a properly packed chute. Proceed cautiously and do it right the first time. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. A brief comment on this series circuit before we begin. It's not on the protoboard. If you build this circuit correctly on the protoboard, you should observe no change between this configuration and that of the one you built on your protoboard. If you deploy the circuit on the protoboard incorrectly, you'll observe a different total resistance value. If I call the left end of R1 node A, notice how the right end of R1 is connected to R2 and R2 only at node B. The right end of R2 is connected to R3 and R3 only at node C. The right end of R3 is the terminus of our series relationship, node D. Notice there is no way current can squeeze around, under, over, to the side of, or travel in any other manner than from node A through R1 to node B through R2 to node C through R3 to node D. Now, build the same series circuit on the protoboard. Here's one of many different valid series configurations for this circuit. This particular configuration proceeds horizontally. Node A is the group of interconnected points defined by row 10, columns A through E. Node B is the group of interconnected points defined by row 10, columns F through J. Node C is the group of interconnected points defined by row 10, columns A through E in the second terminal strip, notice we're jumping over the bus strips between the first and second terminal strips. These are typically reserved for distribution of supply voltages. Continuing on, we travel through R3 to arrive at node D, defined by the group of interconnected points 
defined by row 10, columns F through J. Be cautious when proceeding in a horizontal fashion. If you accidentally short out a resistor by inserting both terminals of that resistor into the same set of interconnected points defining a node, that resistor is no longer in our series relationship. Components go from node to node. You would never tie the same two terminals of a resistor to the same node. It doesn't make sense on a schematic, nor does it make sense to hook up components like this on a protoboard when you look at it from a nodal perspective. A resistance reading for this series circuit, constructed in a horizontal fashion, yields 1054.4 ohms of total resistance as anticipated. Here's yet another valid series configuration of this same circuit. This particular configuration proceeds vertically. Node A is the group of interconnected points defined by row 10, columns F through J on the first terminal strip. Node B is the group of interconnected points defined by row 15, columns F through J in the same terminal strip. Node C is the group of interconnected points defined by row 20, columns F through J. Continuing on, we travel through R3 to arrive at node D, defined by the group of interconnected points, defined by row 25, columns F through J. Be cautious when proceeding in the vertical fashion. If you accidentally open a connection between nodes, no current will flow and no voltage will be dropped across any component. All voltage will be dropped across the open. It's easy to be off by one row when inserting components or wires. Sometimes it helps to look at your protoboard from the side, not just overhead. Such off by one errors are glaringly obvious at different angles, and oftentimes imperceptible from single vantage points. If node C is defined as the group of interconnected points defined by row 20, columns F through J, and you accidentally insert the top of R3 into row 21, columns F through J, there's an open in your circuit between row 20 and row 21, the bottom of R2 and the top of R3. Resistance will be infinite between nodes A and D, and no current will flow. Close inspection of your as-belt circuit or use of the voltmeter will reveal the open circuit and it can be fixed. A resistance reading for this series circuit, constructed in a vertical fashion, yields 1054.7 ohms of total resistance as anticipated. What is my preferred orientation for circuit building? It depends. I'm embarrassed to admit it, but I typically build circuits just like the schematic is pictured. If the schematic shows a series relationship of R1, R2, and R3 going from left to right, I build it left to right. If the schematic shows a series relationship of R1, R2, and R3 going up to down, I just build it up to down. Call me lazy or call me efficient. I like having a one-to-one -one correspondence between what's on my board and what's on my schematic. You can use as many or as little jump bar wires as you want, but my advice is to use as many as you need. No more, no less. Extra wires don't get you extra points. Extra wires just make your circuit as colorful and as confusing as George Clinton's hair. Notice I took a resistance reading of these circuits while they were unenergized and disconnected from a source. Any other method would damage your meter or at the very least produce an erroneous reading. Sticking with a vertical series arrangement, let's set up our voltage source to supply 12 volts. Here I'm using the DMM and voltmeter mode to adjust the power supply output to 12 volts for an unloaded condition. Unloaded means the power supply is not supplying current because I've yet to actually hook it to my circuit. Once I actually hook the circuit to my power supply, there's a chance that the loaded output voltage of the power supply might dip slightly when it's actually supplying current. By keeping the voltmeter attached while in loaded conditions, I'm aware of this dip and I can readjust the power supply as needed back up to our required 12 volts. Now being truly supplied by a 12 volt source, I can take voltage readings across individual components. V1 is observed to be 3.03 volts, in absolute agreement with our expected value. V2 is observed to be 3.73 volts, very close to what we expected. Finally, V3 is observed to be 5.25 volts, again extremely close to our expectations. Given our observed voltage drops across these resistors, I'm reasonably confident we're off to a good start. Being this is a series circuit, a single current measurement at any point in our circuit should be sufficient opportunity to compare our expected versus observed current values. However, I'd like to belabor this point by taking four different current measurements in this same circuit at the following points. Between the positive terminal of our power supply and R1, 
between R1 and R2, between R2 and R3, and finally between R3 and the negative terminal of our power supply. Each of the four different current measurements require the following steps. The power supply must be turned off, the circuit must be broken at our chosen point of insertion, the ammeter must be placed in series with the element is intended to measure current through, and then the power supply must be turned back on. For placement of the ammeter between the positive terminal of our supply and R1, this requires the introduction of another node in our schematic. I'll call it A prime. Notice that A and A prime are separate nodes, and the only way to get from A to A prime is through the ammeter. If A was connected to A prime, there would be no incentive for current to travel through the ammeter, and the ammeter would in effect be bypassed by having its indoor connected to its outdoor. No current would flow through it, and the ammeter would read zero amps, despite there being a clearly energized circuit. In practice, current measurements require the introduction of another node on the protoboard, but very often by simply removing the lead on the protoboard, you are in effect doing the same thing. Notice all current emanating from my power supply positive terminal is entering the red lead, and this same red lead is plugged into the banana jack on the protoboard. All current leaves the banana jack and enters the orange wire and is channeled straight into the ammeter indoor. This is node A. Current enters the indoor, flows through the ammeter, and comes out the outdoor at node A prime. There is no other way to get to node A prime from A other than by going through the ammeter. Take your time and think about proper placements of ammeters. Draw a picture and visualize current traveling through your circuit. Don't rush this important step and damage your circuit, your meter, your source, or yourself. Don't worry about damaging your lab partner. They're largely expendable. In this case, the ammeter is reading 11.23 milliamperes as we expected. The second placement of our ammeter in this series circuit between R1 and R2 also yields 11.23 milliamperes, as does placement between R2 and R3, as does placement between R3 and the negative terminal of our source. Current through elements in series is the same. We are done with part one. Very rarely will a lab go this well. So let's introduce two common errors and discuss the steps necessary to detect and resolve them. These two common scenarios are shorts and opens. A short is the errant addition of a low resistance path in parallel to a component. The parallel combination of anything and in effect a zero ohm resistor effectively yield zero ohms of resistance for the shorted component. The shorted component and the shorted component only is removed from consideration. If we were to short out R3, the 470 ohm resistor for this series combination, pause the lecture and consider the anticipated effects. Notably, how will the shorting of R3 affect total resistance? How will total resistance affect source current and how will source current affect the voltage drop across the remaining resistors in this series circuit? And finally, how will this affect the voltage drop across R3, the shorted component? Don't worry about the specifics, nor busy yourself with calculations just yet. Just answer these simple questions with simple answers. Will the desired quantity go up, go down, or stay the same? Use your understanding of Ohm's law to predict how this circuit will respond with R3 removed from consideration. If R3 is removed from consideration by becoming in effect a zero ohm resistor, the total resistance of our series combination is now just that of R1 and R2. Total resistance has gone down. With reduced total resistance, current will go up. With increased current, the voltage drop across R1 and R2 will increase. Current ordinarily intended for R3 is routed through the zero ohm short instead. With no current flowing through the shorted R3, there will be no voltage drop across it. Using Kirchhoff's voltage law on our in effect two resistor series circuit can be additionally stated that with V1 and V2 now being the only voltage drops in the circuit, all voltage rise will be dropped across these two elements. E equals V1 plus V2. It's like the shorted component isn't even there anymore. This could be a potentially dangerous situation if R3 was an essential current controlling element, keeping current below a manageable limit. With increased current draw by R1 and R2, the power dissipated by these elements sharply increases. 
Now that we've briefly discussed the expected results of a shorted component in sufficiently general terms, just put some numbers in there. Pause the lecture and see if you can determine the anticipated current draw, the voltage drop across each component, and the power dissipated by each component when R3 is shorted out and effectively removed from consideration. Keep using the nominal values for your resistors, that way we can compare the same figures. When R3 is no longer in our circuit, the only opposition remaining to current is that posed by R1 and R2. Total resistance drops to 600 ohms. With reduced total resistance, source current should rise. With increased current through our remaining resistors, we should expect a larger voltage drop across them. V1 should be close to 5.4 volts. V2 should be close to 6.6 .6 volts. With current being diverted through the short, no current will flow through R3 and there will be no voltage drop across it. Notice V1 plus V2 is equal to our total voltage rise E, again providing additional proof that no voltage drop will occur across our shorted component. Finally, with increased current draw and increased voltage drop across both R1 and R2, the power dissipated by resistor 1 rises dramatically to 108 milliwatts. The power dissipated by resistor 2 also rises dramatically to 132 milliwatts. We're still well inside the quarter watt or 250 milliwatt power rating of these resistors, but notice the dramatic leap in power dissipation because of power's geometric relationship with current. This goes to show you that shorting out one component inside a series relationship can cause others to go up in smoke. With no voltage drop, nor any current flowing through it, R3 is dissipating zero watts. Our source current will be 20 milliampers also, and our power input by the source will dramatically rise to 240 milliwatts. Let's short out R3 by placing a low resistance wire across the two nodes, C and D, and observe the effects. Source current rises to 19.8 milliampers as expected. The voltage drop across R1 increases to approximately 5.4 volts as expected. The voltage drop across R2 increases to approximately 6.6 .6 volts as expected. The voltage drop across R3 shorted component dramatically decreases to zero volts as expected. This is the shorted component because there is no voltage drop across it. The simple realization that total resistance decreases, current increases, the voltage drop across the remaining components increases, and there is no voltage drop across the shorted component is the key to identification and resolution of this problem. If you are presented a troubleshooting scenario in which an element inside a series relationship does not exhibit a voltage drop, and other elements in the series relationship exhibit larger voltage drops than expected, that element with no voltage drop is the shorted component. The larger take home point is this, know what to expect. Do the calculations and have a basic understanding of how the system is intended to operate before you troubleshoot it. You can't lift any meaningful weight if you don't have a floor to stand on. In addition to a low resistance wire placed in parallel, other equally heinous actions can effectively short out components. Consider a resistor with both terminals connected to the same set of interconnected points defining a node. Two terminal components aren't ordinarily hooked to the same node and must be placed from node to node if they are to perform their intended function. A resistor, regardless of the magnitude, presents no opposition to current flow when deployed in such a manner. Stop doing this. This isn't how a protoboard is intended to be used. Learn to use a protoboard correctly. If you need practice using a protoboard, practice using the protoboard. Grab a DMM in ohmmeter mode, a couple of components, and build circuits on a protoboard. This can't be learned just by watching an online lecture or reading about it in a textbook. The skill must be learned through hands-on experience. This being said, the Lab Practices Intro to Protoboards lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel at least attempts to give you a primer on the subject and provides general guidelines to the discovery process. Consider incorrect placement of instrumentation inside a series circuit. For example, an ammeter placed not in series with these elements as required, but rather in parallel with one of them. An ammeter can be modeled as an extremely low resistance path. This low resistance path in parallel to R3 effectively removes it from consideration, and the only elements controlling current are R1 and R2. Current again spikes to 19.4 milliampers, not the 11.2 milliampers we'd ordinarily anticipate for this series combination of three elements. Long story short, if current is too high, 
It's because resistance is too low. Either you're using the wrong components, you're building the wrong circuit, or you're shorting out components with a low resistance path, be it an errant wire, an incorrect use of the ammeter, or incorrect placement in the protoboard. Shorted components cause current and series circuits to rise. If this was a current limited power supply and we drop the resistance too low, we might enter constant current mode where the power supply simply refuses to supply current in excess of some preset maximum by dropping its output voltage. If this source was protected by a circuit breaker or a fuse in series with the circuit and the shorted component caused current draw in excess of the breaker's or fuse's rated current, the breaker would open or the fuse would blow, effectively turning off the whole circuit and preventing potential damage. A short, an event ordinarily associated with large current draw precipitated an open, an event normally associated with no current draw. In this spirit, let us transition to the second common troubleshooting event, opens. An open is an infinite resistance through which no current can flow. With no current flowing through our circuit, no voltage drop will occur across any element. This being said, since there is a voltage rise, there will be a voltage drop somewhere within the circuit. The voltage drop appears across the open. If you want to use a memory aid, recall that the largest voltage drop in a series circuit occurs across the largest resistor. You can't get much larger than infinite, so all voltage drop will occur across that open. Let's see if this is the case. Here I've opened the connection between R2 and R3 at node C. No current flows through the circuit despite the fact that there is a 12 volt rise between node A and D. What gives? The voltage drop across R1 is 0 volts, as is the voltage drop across R2, as is the voltage drop across R3. Only when we progressively work our way through different combinations of terminals do we find the voltage drop across the bottom terminal of R2 and the top terminal of R3 do we find a voltage drop of 12 volts. This is the open. Ordinarily, the bottom terminal of R2 and the top terminal of R3 share the same node C. Given C is a single point, there shouldn't be a difference between C with reference to C. If at the terminals of components hooked to the same node, you observe a voltage differential, those components aren't hooked to the same node. There is an open between these two points. Another way to detect an open is the use of a common point of reference, in this case, node D. We can leave the reference lead of the voltmeter hooked to node D and progressively walk the high lead through all component terminals. Consider Kirchhoff's voltage law for our ordinarily functional circuit. Given no open, we'd expect the following voltage drops across each component. It can ordinarily be said that node A is 12 volts higher than node D. If we dropped 3.03 volts across R1 to get to node B, we are now effectively 8.97 volts higher than node D. If we then ordinarily drop an additional 3.7 volts across R2 to get to node C, we should now be effectively 5.27 volts higher than node D. With an open in our circuit, this is no longer the case. The top of R1, node A, is 12 volts higher than node D as expected. However, the bottom of R1, node B, is not in accordance with our expectations. On the other side of node B, at the top of R2, we also see a voltage differential of 12 volts with respect to node D. In the bottom of R2, ordinarily node C, we find it to be 12 volts higher than node D. On the other side of node C, the top of R3, we find a differential of 0 volts higher than node D. Stop right there you found the problem. Between these two components, ordinarily connected to the same node, there is a voltage differential between them. This is the open circuit, and no current will flow through it. Beyond systematic inspection of a series path using a voltmeter, an incredibly handy bit of advice in resolving open circuits is to just look at the circuit. Close inspection will often yield an off by one error, a severed wire, or a wire just dangling off in space. Take necessary safety precautions when troubleshooting such open circuits, lest you become part of the circuit. Before we wrap up today's experimental verification lecture, let's do a bonus round activity. 
featuring not elements in series, but rather sources in series. Before we do so, let me introduce you to my little friend. Here's a high power three terminal variable resistor. It's a giant potentiometer. And I use this guy when I'm lazy and I don't want to worry about power calculations. In this case, it's a 104 ohm potentiometer rated to carry 2.3 amps. In this case, this potentiometer can dissipate I squared R or approximately 550 watts of power, more than sufficient for our application and well in excess of what this approximately 20 watt power supply is capable of producing. This is like using a howitzer to go squirrel hunting. Not only will the neighborhood be safe from squirrels, neighboring counties may not have to worry about squirrels either. Looks like we got two terminals on one end and a third on the other. How's this thing work? Let's put our DMM in ohm meter mode and figure it out. The resistance between these two terminals is approximately 104 ohms, regardless of the position of the adjustable slider. These are the A to C terminals. I'm going to call the one on the right A and just keep the lead there. I'll move the other lead to what I call the B terminal. I can adjust the resistance from A to B using the adjustable slider. If I walk RAB down to 25-ish ohms, where does the rest of the 104 ohms of total resistance appear? You guessed it. The remaining 79-ish ohms appears between the B and C terminals. We'll employ this high power potentiometer in a little bit after we discuss voltage sources in series. Recall from the Kirchhoff's Voltage Law lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, that sources in series with one another can be hooked up in one of two fashions, series opposing or series aiding. Let's go over series opposing relationships first. A series opposing arrangement is one where two sources with a current controlling element placed between them try to force current in opposite directions through the current controlling element. In this case, the strongest source determines the direction of current flow. An example of a series opposing arrangement might be a battery charging application in which the negative terminal of both sources are tied together and the higher voltage alternator charges up the lower voltage battery by forcing current into the battery and effectively reversing the chemical process that originally discharged it. Key to the safe, efficient, and effective charging process is maintenance of the charging current at a recommended magnitude for a recommended period of time. With no current controlling element between the two sources, such a series opposing relationship would cause the higher voltage source to rapidly discharge into the lower voltage source with potentially catastrophic levels of current. Spoiler alert, I'm not going to actually hook up the series opposing arrangement because the power supply I'm using is not intended to have current flow backwards through it. It's not a battery. We'll cover batteries and battery charging in later lectures. I will, however, put a round in the chamber and just not pull the trigger. We'll make use of the two adjustable outputs of a triple output power supply. Recall from the lab practices intro to power supplies lecture available at the Big Bad Tech channel this particular power supply has three selectable modes regarding the relationship of the two adjustable power supplies. The outputs can be independent from each other, in series with each other, or in parallel with each other. Right now, these two supplies are in independent mode and not in any way related or attached to one another, and both are independently adjustable. I'll use the DMM and DC voltmeter mode to adjust the A power supply to 20 volts between its two terminals, I'll then use the DMM and DC voltmeter mode to adjust the B supply to 8 volts between its two terminals. Now I'll tie the two negative terminals of these formerly independent power supplies together. The coiled up red cable in the picture is serving this purpose. With my reference lead on the B output positive terminal, the DMM is showing me that the A output positive is approximately 12 volts higher than our reference lead. It makes sense. If both sources share a negative terminal, and the B source brings its positive terminal 8 volts higher than the negative terminal, and the A source brings its positive terminal 20 volts higher than its negative terminal, it stands to conjecture that there is a 12 volt differential between the A and B positive terminals. A KVL analysis of this loop supports this visualization. Start here, travel in this direction. 
rise EA, fall VAB with the assumed polarity, fall EB. Given EA and EB are known to be respectively 20 volts and 8 volts, in solving for VAB, we find it to be 12 volts. Any electrical load hooked between these two terminals would experience a 12 volt differential, and current would flow from the A source through the resistor into our B source. If our 104 ohm potentiometer was strung between the A and B terminals, it would experience a current of approximately 115.4 milliampers. If the B source was a battery that could safely handle 115.4 milliampers, it would start the charging process. In this case, this particular power supply, the B source would just blow up. Actually, just kidding. Actually, this power supply has a pretty cunning protective mechanism and that it would elevate the output of the B terminal to match that of the supply forcing current into it, in this case, 20 volts. With 20 volts on either side of our electrical load, no current will flow through it because there is no voltage differential. Let's see if we can build a similar relationship. With no connection or relation between the two adjustable outputs and in independent mode, we'll use a voltmeter to check if the A output is still at 20 volts. Now we can use the voltmeter to adjust the B output also up to 20 volts. Now when we link the two 20 volt power supplies negative terminals together, the white cable in this picture is serving this purpose, the voltmeter shows zero volts of difference between the two positive terminals. It makes sense. If both sources share a negative terminal and the B source brings its positive terminal 20 volts higher than its negative terminal, and the A source brings its positive terminal 20 volts higher than its negative terminal, it stands to conjecture that there is a zero volt differential between the A and B positive terminals. A KVL analysis of this loop supports this visualization. Starting here, and traveling in this direction, rise EA, fall VAB with a given polarity, fall EB. Given EA and EB are both known to be 20 volts, and solving for VAB, we find VAB to be zero volts. Any electrical load between these two terminals would be 20 volts higher than the shared negative terminal. However, no differential would be experienced across it. In this case, two identical power supplies in two opposite directions yielded no results. Think back to the times you've moved large pieces of furniture with relatives or friends. Oftentimes you go no place, yet expend a lot of effort doing so because equal and opposite forces cancel each other out. You know what I'm talking about, and if you don't, call up your buddies and have them help you carry a couch or a refrigerator up a spiral staircase, and you'll soon learn what I mean. Now with both outputs at 20 volts, let's move on to a discussion of series aiding sources. Before we do so, I present you with this challenge. I'd like to see you make a 20 volt power supply, provide approximately 15 watts of power to our 104 ohm potentiometer. Don't try too hard though, because Ohm's law says you can't. A 20 volt power supply at most will induce approximately 192.3 milliampers of current through a 104 ohm resistor and dissipate at most approximately 3.8 watts of power. Don't despair though. If you really need at least 15 watts out of a 104 ohm resistor, two 20 volt sources in a series aiding arrangement will do the trick quite nicely. A series aiding arrangement is where one source's positive terminal serves as the reference for another's negative terminal and so on. An example of this type of relationship might be a series aiding string of two six volt batteries in a golf cart or an RV to make an effect a single 12 volt source. Another example might be a series aiding string of 15 PV panels, each supplying 30 volts. This series aiding string would have 15 times 30 or 450 volts across it. In series aiding relationships, voltage is additive. However, current through all elements is the same. If any one of the batteries or solar panels comprising the series aiding string were damaged or otherwise unperforming, the whole string would be affected. Let's investigate these properties. First, we'll build the series aiding arrangement using two independent power supplies, both at 20 volts, by taking the A terminal's negative supply and hooking it to the positive terminal of the B supply. The coiled up red cable in the picture is serving this purpose. Starting at the B supply's negative terminal, we rise 20 volts to the positive terminal, and then the A source takes us an additional 20 volts higher for a total differential of 
40 volts across the whole series arrangement. With the voltmeter reference lead on the B source's negative terminal, we are observing a 40 volt rise at the A terminal positive output as expected. This, in effect, 40 volt power supply can now provide the necessary current and required power input to our 104 ohm resistor. The nanometer reads 384 milliamperes of current being supplied to our potentiometer. Given these figures, any permutation of the power equation yields a power dissipation of approximately 15 watts. Given current in a series relationship is the same, it can be said that this same 384 milliamperes is traveling through both sources. Since the sources are still in independent mode, it is very easy to verify this by placing an ammeter between the B supply positive terminal and the A supply negative terminal. An ammeter in this position also indicates that it is supplying the same 384 milliamperes of current. Let's consider the effects of a damaged source inside a series aiding arrangement. Let's say the B source maxes out at around 300 milliamperes and simply can't provide any more current. In this case, I've purposely current limited the B power supply to 302.3 milliamperes. I've left the A supply alone. Notice the B supply indicates it's pegging the limit and the A supply is just looking over its shoulder with a sour look on its face being like, come on idiot, keep up. Kind of like you and your lab partner's professional relationship. In this case, the underperforming B supply affects the whole series relationship and current through our load drops to 302.3 milliamperes and only dissipates approximately 9.5 watts of power instead of a required 15 watts. Notice how a comparatively small change in current dropping from 384 milliamperes to 302 milliamperes drastically changes power dissipation because of the power function's nonlinear nature. This is meant to simulate the effects of partially shading one of the solar panels in a series aiding relationship. Despite the fact that all other panels within a series string are capable of passing the required current, one restriction inside this long series string squeezes off the whole string's output. Consider another ill effect of a damaged source inside our series aiding arrangement. In this case, neither supply has been current limited. However, the output current is still only 291 milliamperes. A quick check of the supply voltage across both sources indicates that the output of the series aiding relationship has dropped to 30.3 volts. Which supply isn't providing the required 20 volts? Voltage check of the B supply indicates it's still at 20 volts. Voltage check across the A supply indicates that its output has dropped to 10.2 volts. This time the A supply is to blame for not shouldering its share of the burden. This is meant to stimulate a physically damaged battery or solar panel in a series aiding relationship. For reasons I'll explain in later lectures, the voltage output of a battery or solar panel can suffer because of improper or damaged internal connections. Again, notice only a 25% reduction in output voltage going from 40 to approximately 30 volts yields dramatically less power because of the power function's nonlinear nature. Any permutation of the power equation yields an output of only 8.8 .8 watts instead of a required 15 watts. Finally, notice this whole time we've kept the power supply in independent mode and have not made use of the series or parallel mode. Let's work smarter, not harder, and make use of this handy selector switch. Not all power supplies have this feature, nor do all those power supplies that do have this feature work in this exact same manner. But it's a neat discussion topic nonetheless, and worthy of a quick look. We'll deal with the details of the parallel mode in later lectures, but briefly, both the series mode and parallel mode simply close or open a set of switches inside the power supply that place the two normally independent outputs in series or in parallel with one another. In series mode, an internal switch is closed between the B supply positive terminal and the A supply negative terminal. At the most basic level, all this mode does is save you the necessity of tying together the B supply positive terminal and the A supply negative terminal with an external wire. The disadvantage to this mode is that the connection is internal to the power supply and one could not take current measurements between the two power supplies. Additionally, this particular power supply hands over control of both sources to the A supply's voltage and current knobs. In this case, neither the A or B supply is independently adjustable as it was previously. If I set the A supply to 20 volts 
the B supply would similarly track to 20 volts, in this case the series aiding combination of the A and B supplies in the series mode would output a total supply of 40 volts. Notice despite there being no externally visible physical connection between the B positive terminal and the A negative terminal, there still exists a voltage differential of 40 volts across the series combination, yet no voltage differential between the two internally connected terminals. Like I said, we'll discuss parallel supplies in later lectures, but in summary, all the series mode does is connect these two supplies in series aiding arrangement and hands over control of both supplies to one set of knobs. All right, I believe we accomplished what we intended to do during this lecture and prove that this material I present is real, verifiable, usable, and above all, true. In conclusion, this activity verified series circuit properties using real-world components and common electrical instrumentation. We observed current inside series relationships as the same and verified Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's voltage law, and the voltage divider rule. Additionally, we learned the effects of opens and shorts inside series circuits. Finally, we placed independent voltage sources in series with one another in both series opposing and series aiding relationships and learn how to use a handy feature available on some multiple output power supplies to increase output voltage and minimize external wiring. Remember to get inside a safe and supportive lab environment and apply these techniques on real world components and see for yourself the truth. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest. We'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.